Good evening. I'm Alice Simon and I welcome all of you to the second annual symposium on natural resources. And it is my pleasure to welcome all of you who are here. Uh, last year we talked about different energy sources and tonight we're talking about water. Um, we have a variety of groups who are here. For those of us at dinner, you will hear a repeat of what I said. Um, it's a very impressive list of people who have come together for a common interest in water. Um, we have the Ohio Wesleyan University Sustainability Task Force, the Alumni, the Alumni Advisory Board of the Walter Monte Center, we have faculty, staff, and students, as well as people from the local Delaware community. I also am pleased to welcome representatives from a variety of organizations. They include the Delaware County Economic Development, the Ohio Env Environmental Protection Agency, Crawford County Park District, Peacock Water, Sustainable Delaware, Edward Jones, Tech Columbus, the Delaware Historic Preservation Commission, The Ohio State University, Delaware County, The Ohio Environmental Council, Price Farm Organics, The Mid-Ohio Regional Planning Commission, Hard Scrabble Farms, and the City of Delaware. If I have not mentioned you, I apologize, but I'm very, very pleased and excited that we're here this evening to talk about this important issue. Um, it is my pleasure to introduce to you the president of the university, Dr. Rock Jones. He's a great guy. He may not remember. Great, great guy. Thank you, Alice, and it is my pleasure to join uh, Dr. Simon in welcoming all of you to the campus of Ohio Wesleyan and to uh, this uh, symposium this evening. As uh, Dr. Simon noted, this is the second annual Environmental and Natural Resources uh, Symposium uh, organized uh, by Dr. Andy Meyer from our Department of e Economics, whom I will uh, introduce in a, in a moment. We're especially welcome, uh, pleased to welcome this evening uh, guests from beyond the, the Ohio Wesleyan community, uh, friends from the town of Delaware, uh, from central Ohio, and even some who have driven from other parts of the state to, to be with us this evening, and a special welcome to our distinguished panelists uh, from whom you will hear this evening. For those of you who are guests of Ohio Wesleyan this evening, uh, the Voltamati Center for Economics, Business, and Entrepreneurship is one of the many centers and programs on this campus that offers resources not only to our students and faculty and staff, but to the wider community. And throughout the academic year, there are numer numerous lectures, symposia, uh, concerts, presentations, um, and, and other things of interest to the community. And we hope that you will uh, take advantage of these opportunities and feel welcome on our campus as they come about. In about a month or so, uh, the Voltamati Center will host the annual Heisler Business Lec Ethics Lecture Series uh, when our speaker this year will be Jeff Long, the Director of Athletics at the University of Arkansas, who is an alumnus of, of Ohio Wesleyan. And so we hope that you will watch the calendar and join us for other events host hosted by the Voltamati Center as well as by other programs uh, and departments on campus. Tonight we have the opportunity to think together with uh, the leadership of the distinguished panel before you about uh, one of the most pressing issues our planet faces, and that is the issue of the scarcity of water. Uh, just two or three factoids, you know these facts uh, better than I probably. 780 million people lack access to clean water. That's more than two and a half times the population of the United States. Every 20 seconds, a child dies from a water-related illness. Women spend 200 million hours a day collecting water. I could go on and on, but just a reminder of the pressing issue of the scarcity of water on our planet, the need to make good use of the water uh, that is available, and the importance of the topic uh, that we have the opportunity to consider this evening. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, to you now uh, Dr. Andy Meyer, who joined the Department of Economics, coming from Colorado University in Boulder, Colorado, in 2009. He's the first environmental economist at OWU, and he's the coordinator of this evening's presentations of, and of now of this annual symposium. Dr. Meyer's research interests include environmental and experimental economics. 
He has recently researched how much individuals value improvements in river basin water quality and how their time preferences affect their willingness to pay for better water quality when improvements are delayed. He regularly teaches environmental and natural resource economics, research methods, and principles of economics, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you uh, the moderator of our symposium this evening, Dr. Andy Meyer. Andy? Uh, thank you, Rock, and thank you, Alice, and thank all of you for being here this evening. Uh, tonight, we have three distinguished speakers who are going to speak about water issues. And so the purpose of tonight's event is to really have an interdisciplinary dialogue. We will cover economics, policy, and science related to, uh, to water. And water is really an important issue. It's something that we may oftentimes take for granted. You know, we're used to just turning on the tap and out comes the clean water. Um, but a few statistics here. According to the UN, 40% of the world's population lives in areas with moderate to high water stress. And it's predicted also by the UN that by year 2025, two-thirds of the world's population will live in areas with moderate to severe water stress. And so you might think of, you know, when we think about water scarcity, oftentimes we think of places like Africa, but there are also issues closer to home. There are issues of water stress here in the United States, especially in the, the Western United States. Also, Mexico, China, and India uh, are places where groundwater is being consumed faster than it's being replenished. Tonight, we'll hear from three different speakers, as I mentioned. We'll hear from George, El Maragi, Chief of the Division of Surface Water at the Ohio EPA. We will also hear from Nicholas Flores, Professor and Department Chair at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And from Doug Southgate, who is a Professor and Associate Director of the Subsurface Energy Resource Center at The Ohio State University. The format of tonight's event will be each speaker will give about a 10 to 15 minute presentation on their chosen topic, and then there will be an opportunity for each speaker to ask a question or two of each other, and then after that point we'll open up the dialogue to the audience for questions. When we open up the floor to audience, uh, please raise your hand if you have a question and we'll bring the microphone around so that we can uh, hear you. The first speaker tonight will be George Elmeragi. He is the, he has been the chief of the Ohio EPA Division of Surface Water since 2005. George is involved in and oversees all aspects of the division from permitting to compliance to surface water improvement grants. He is going to speak tonight about nutrient and sediment issues in Ohio water bodies. So please welcome George. Uh, good evening. It is a great honor to be here tonight. Um, last October, we celebrated several important events. We celebrated the 65th anniversary of breaking the sound barrier. We celebrated the 50th anniversary of the release of the first James, James Bond movie. We celebrated the 40th anniversary of the creation of the Ohio Environmental Protection Agency and also we celebrated the 40th anniversary of the enactment of the Clean Water Act. Uh, the Clean Water Act usually described as the most successful environmental legislation in history. And I agree with this assessment. We achieved a lot of progress since the enactment of the Clean Water Act. However, the Clean Water Act was not a perfect legislation. I give you a couple examples of deficiency in the Clean Water Act. The Clean Water Act envisions that by 1982 we will eliminate the discharge of all pollutant. What this means? This means like cities and industry will discharge distilled water. Of course, this didn't happen. The reason the people who wrote the Clean Water Act included this provision they were kind of influenced by the moon landing. They said like, well, it took us 10 years to land in the moon, so it will 
Within 10 years, we can eliminate all the discharge of pollutant. The, this goal maybe was not realistic and maybe uh, is not needed at this point. We are doing quite well with the program we have right now. It is not <coughs> complete elimination, but we control the charge of uh, pollutant and we are achieving a good progress. Another deficiency in the Clean Water Act is it didn't address the discharge from, from non-point source. This point is very important because if you look to impairment in our streams, in our lakes, most of the impairment right now is created because of non-point source and discharge of nutrients. 10 years or 15 years ago, if you ask me how we resolve this issue, I would tell you like we need to issue a permit for every, farmers, every farmer in uh, Ohio and give them permit with some conditions about what they can discharge and what they cannot discharge. I realize that is not practical solution and maybe the approach which Ohio is taking right now maybe is a realistic one. We are designating some watershed as watershed and distress. And for this watershed, we try to regulate farmers. We have one watershed in distress in Ohio right now, and that is the Grand Lake St. Mary. And maybe you expand this program in the future. The Clean Water Act goals is to have fishable, swimmable, and drinkable water. I will just kind of try to show to you where we stand with achieving these goals. If you look to this graph, it is kind of showing the improvement in the fishable part, like fishable, swimmable, fishable, swimmable, and the drinkable. That's the fishable part how the fish and the bugs doing in our large streams. Large streams are defined as streams with a drainage basin more than 500 square miles. And as you can see from this graph, we're really doing quite well. We are about 90% of our large streams are in attainment with aquatic life use designation. So that's good progress and they achieved because industry and city did wonderful job and controlling their discharge. However, if you look to small streams and the watersheds, the picture is completely different. If you look here, like we are, have like 60% of our streams in attainment with aquatic life use designation. But more alarming is the trend. This trend is kind of flat. We are not achieving an improvement. But trend is not a destiny. We can change this trend. We can change it by controlling the charge from non-point source, the charge from farm fields and from cities. I will talk a little bit about current challenges. And the first one I will talk about is nutrients. If you look to impairment in Ohio streams, lakes, you find like 40-80% of the impairment is created by nutrients. And if you look to Lake Erie, the near shore, two-thirds of Lake, Lake Erie shores are impaired because of nutrient. What nutrient does? It create algae. It encourages the growth of algae. And the algae, of course, consume oxygen during the day, I'm sorry, consume oxygen during the night, and they produce oxygen during the day. And this fluctuation in DO, dissolved oxygen, create impairment for aquatic life. In addition to that, of course, like it can create the, some of the algae, uh, we call it harmful algae, which really produce toxic materials that impact the skin of people, if you drink the toxic material, it will destroy your kidney and maybe the nervous system. So uh, harm for algae bloom become big issue in Ohio as the last three or four years. 
this some pictures from Lake Erie and that's happened for years 2011 as you can see like algae can be a big problem uh, this picture is taken by satellite and is showing a plume in the western Lake Erie basin and you can see the green stuff how big of a bloom is created in the western Lake Erie and just just there's some kind of a boat and just what is you see behind the boat so you can see the extent of the problem and how severe it can be and this picture from Grand Lake St. Mary during year 2010 how thick is the bloom and how thick is the bloom here it can be a real problem you just can see it and if you can analyze for the toxics, you see really it can be very harmful. Last summer, we have nine uh, lakes which showing algae problems. Eight of them is inland lakes and the another in a beach on Lake Erie. That is the state park in Lake Erie beaches. And also we issued an uh, advisory for four uh, lakes. Grand Lake St. Mary, Bakai Lake, Mami Bay Beach, and the Oakland Beach was in Lake County. What Ohio is doing to control this problem? We are taking some actions here. We formed two work groups to address the nutrient issue. The first work group is to address the non-point source, mainly from farms. And the, the three directors from National Resources, Agriculture, and Ohio EPA, whom the governor refers to them usually as the three amigos, uh, convene a group of 100 people to come with recommendation about how to control nutrient uh, from non-point source. The recommendation mainly is to follow the four R's. You need to apply fertilizer, the right fertilizer, at the right rate, at the right time, and to do the right placement. Uh, they advise farmer to analyze their soil for phosphorus, and based on the amount of phosphorus in their soil, they determine how much fertilizer they need to add the, to their fields. Some farmers, they like to use their field to disposal of manure. Like they add manure more than needed. And as a result, you have a storm event. The storm event wash the manure and go to streams and to the lakes and create a problem. Uh, another recommendation from the non-point source group is to have regulatory authority for to the Department of Natural Resources to take action against farmers who are not following the appropriate practice. Also, we formed a group to address point sources. And they came with few recommendations. One of the recommendations is to try to track who is charging nutrient and the impact of this discharge on streams and lakes. They like to find ways to reduce the cost of treatment of nutrients. They like to find a way to find funding to help municipality and industry treat for nutrients. Another approach we are taking is to take the recommendations from these two work groups and put it in a strategy. We intend to finalize the strategy sometime this year. Uh, also, we are working to uh, uh, do rules which contain water quality standard for phosphorus and nitrogen. Additional action we are taking, we are forming a group to study the problem of, of extra phosphorus or extreme phosphorus discharges to Lake Erie. Uh, it's just kind of amazing what's going on in Lake Erie. Uh, in 1995, Lake Erie was in very good shape. 
and since then it started to degrade again. And until now, we are not very clear about what happened. But one thing we are suspecting is that the discharge of dissolved phosphorus is increasing. And the, one of the reasons for that is the excessive nutrient applied on the fields. So we need to kind of study this problem and come with management recommendation about how to eliminate it. Uh, for Grand Lake St. Mary, we so far invested $20 million in Grand Lake St. Mary to take care of the problem. $8 million alone to do alum treatment. We did so far two alum treatment to help a, a Grand Lake St. Mary. What alum treatment does is to tie the phosphorus and precipitate it so it will not become available for algae. And also we're doing a lot of monitoring in Grand Lake St. Mary to try to understand what's going on there and to be sure that we alert people when we have a problem. I think that's all what I have uh, about uh, uh, the Clean Water Act and nutrient, and appreciate uh, inviting me today here. Thank you. Thanks, George. So next we will have Nicholas Flores, professor and department chair at the University of Colorado at Boulder. And Nick works on the development and refinement of methodologies for eliciting environmental preferences. Uh, another interesting note about Nick is that he was my dissertation advisor at the University of Colorado and so I'm very honored that he has taken the time to, to come out here and, and speak with us. <laughs> Examples of, of research that Nick has worked on include an analysis of how multiple public goods interact in determining mon monetary values for changes in these goods, theoretical examination of non-use values for an environmental goods, and numerous valuation studies. And when I say valuation studies, I mean with coming up with a value of how much environmental amenities are worth to people. Nick is going to speak tonight about the economics of groundwater issues. So please welcome Nick. Thank you, Andy. He, uh, he, he bribed me to pass him, you know, so. Um, well, I want to thank you all for inviting me from OWU. I hadn't heard that. Is that correct? OWU. Um, the, the, the magic of universities is bringing together people who are interested and in to think through problems, and this is certainly an important problem. Um, so when Andy invited me, uh, you know, he just said, well, what, what topics are you interested in water? And so I find that groundwater is a, is a really interesting economic problem uh, that's not receiving enough attention. So I got interested in this. I'm on the US EPA Science Advisory Board. Um, and, and EPA issued a, a report to study the value of water in the US economy. And so we had a lot of experts that came in and the advisory board listened to what they had to say about water issues. And I thought that um, groundwater wasn't receiving enough attention, so I got interested in it. Um, I'm going to organize my talk tonight. I want to first talk about scarcity of groundwater and things in the United States in particular that I see are problematic. Um, and then I couldn't leave alone the issue of groundwater contamination that people are uh, concerned with with regard to hydraulic fracturing. So I want to talk a little bit about that. Um, the talk is definitely the dismal science, because I, I don't offer up much in the way of solutions, but these are things that I think that are important for, for people to, to really think about, and so I'll preface it with that. Um, let's see. So just a, a few statistics, first of all. Uh, so groundwater is really vital to the U.S. economy. So if we look across just from the, let me see this, this way so I can. So if we lo look across this, uh, thermoelectric water withdrawals that really account for a lot, but they almost use no water. They almost consume no water. But that's, you know, I, I, I wasn't, uh, you know, not being a water economist, when I started looking at this, I was surprised at how much they represent in withdrawals. But groundwater as a percentage of, of total withdrawals um, is really actually qu quite significant. And if you 
think about just double those numbers on the bottom when you take away thermoelectric um, withdrawals. And so groundwater it plays a really important role in the U.S. economy, uh, and it supplies a lot of our water. But more importantly, when we look at some states, they're really highly reliant on, um, on groundwater. You know, Arizona has almost 50% of its total water supply comes out of groundwater. California has large proportions. Um, Nebraska is really large. So for a lot of places in the West, the game is groundwater. So even though if you look at those statistics um, f from the statewide level, a lot of communities are 100% reliant on groundwater uh, in, in Colorado and communities in, in California and in Arizona. Um, and so those places exist because of groundwater, right? One of the problems that we're running into though is that um, so we think about property rights, okay? Property rights for groundwater uh, evolved out of surface rights for, most, for the most part. And, I'm, and rather than go into a lot of detail, let me just kind of summarize. So as so we moved into the United States, uh, this absolute dominion or the rule of capture was the rule in groundwater. So riparian rights for surface waters allow people to withdraw water as much as they need for beneficial use. Um, and then as long as it's not, it doesn't represent much of a problem unless we start running short. Uh, correlative rights um, basically look kind of like a seniority system. That's in place in California and a few western states where basically even with respect to groundwater, it's first in line, first in right. So in, in, in Colorado, all water is owned. Even water that won't, you'll only see every 50 years is actually owned by individual rights, own, rights holders. Um, and so correlative rights is, is similar to uh, um, the doctrine of prior appropriation where it's basically proportional to the amount of land you have and sometimes we can ration and not. Um, these other doctrines are basically, if you look at the overall property rights structure for water, it, re it revolves around if there's enough water, we'll let you use as much as you want. If it doesn't interfere the, the way, ground, the, way the, the water law evolved, if it interferes with others, some states, but not all, um, you might have some problems there. But for the most part, it's almost impossible to jointly manage um, groundwater, and that presents a problem to us. Um, so one of the, the real problems, this joint management problem, uh, turns out from an economic point to, to create some problems. In particular, uh, you have inefficient production capacity. So well owners, um, when you draw down, they start interfering with one another, and that creates problems. Uh, aquifers, like in, the, in, in Texas, Texas actually, the Texas Supreme Court, just upheld the rule of capture. So they tried to do some, uh, in the Edwards Aquifer area, which supplies water for San Antonio, and, uh, and part of, and up into the hill country towards Austin, they tried to create a conservation district to actually get some joint management of the, of the Edwards Aquifer, and the, and the Texas Supreme Court struck that down and upheld the rule of capture. Um, so essentially what's happened there is even though a lot of people viewed it as a victory for property rights, from a community standpoint for the joint management of the aquifer, it was a real problem and, and, and there are problems ahead for that. And so it, it, some of these, the problems with the property rights system are that it creates unsustainable use. So it's not, in a lot of states it's not a problem. Like there are a lot of places where groundwater recharge is significant, where you have a good supply of water, but in many western states this is a real problem where you have unsustainable use. So when, you, when your withdrawals exceed your extraction rate on groundwater, economists refer to this as groundwater mining. Okay? So private owners of minerals, so there's a, been a theory that actually holds up pretty well empirically. Is if you look at people who are developing mines and things like that, and they're the exclusive property rights holder to mines, they consider the opportunity cost. So if I, the more I take out of the ground today, the less I have in the ground for, for the future, right? And so you want to balance off of what's happening in the future market. Um, right now in, in groundwater, the, the, the way property rights are designed and the way they work, they actually don't encourage 
any incorporation of the future cost, so the opportunity cost, um, even in states with, with tradable property rights. And so this, this creates a, a real problem as I see it. And so, so places like Phoenix at some point who are so reliant on groundwater, they're gonna run out of groundwater. There are a few communities in Colorado where you know, at current trends, their groundwater supplies only last about 70 years. So what do you do beyond that? So my takeaway points, and this, was a, this is a really dismal science piece of this. Um, my takeaway point is, right now, property rights, the way they're designed for groundwater in the United States in areas where you're exceeding the, uh, the recharge rate is, we're in trouble. And this turns out to be, given the reliance, as I pointed out in those statistics, particularly in Western states, right now there is no incorporation of this. And so as an economist, um, I see this as something that we want to think about, well, what would be the, what is the societal cost of, of ignoring this, right? Because you can, we have theories and we actually have em empirical methods where we can address this and I think it's a, a ripe topic. Um, and what will happen? I mean, if I look at uh, the, the extraction rate in Nebraska is really, really rapid. I think it's like 20 feet a year in their aquifer. So what's Nebraska going to be when there's no water? So I think that that's an important thing for us to think about. So moving on, um, so uh, yeah, I know that people in the state of Ohio are very familiar with this topic. Um, so f fracturing is a big deal, right? I mean, uh, the thing that's happened, you know, with the combination of horizontal drilling and fracturing is old, right? Hydraulic fracturing is an old method. Um, but horizontal drilling has caused this to really take off in the past 15 years. And it's been great in from regards to um, proven reserves and, and production of uh, shale gas. Um, so these are old statistics. This is the, well, you know, I found these from the Energy Information Agency's website. Uh, but a four-factor, four-fold increase just from 2007 to 2010. But I think the development rate has been much higher the past few years. So this is turning out to be um, a, a big deal, right? This is turning out to be a big deal. Um, a lot of people are really worried about environmental issues with regard to hydraulic fracturing as we read in the, pay, in the news. I just saw, Randy sent me links and I saw on, uh, on, on Twitter feed um, all the stuff that was going down in Youngstown, right? And so a lot of people are concerned about this. Um, I'm going to focus on, on risk to groundwater contamination. So. This is a paper, there's an, a National Bureau of Economic Research working paper that I ran upon. This is not a peer-reviewed paper, so I just, I'm gonna point that out. Um, but these are some people I know, they were at Duke University, and they, look, they did a study of looking at the impact on property values of hydraulic fracturing nearby, and found some interesting results that within 2,000 meters of drilling, people who are on um, groundwater versus those who are on city water really saw, uh, you know, that their property values were, were affected, according to this study. <clears throat> now, um, if people are worried about it, this may be just all fear, right? This, I'm not saying that, that, you know, there's anything real here, but certainly this suggests that people are worried about this, and so there are economic, big economic issues associated with it. So one of, the, one of the things I want to comment on is so I looked up a lot, so I've worked in natural resource damage assessment, mainly with regard to oil spills and chemical spills, so the economics of that. So I started looking at um, some, of the, some of the legal writing on hydraulic fracturing in there. When I, one of the articles I read said that right now there are probably about 50 active suits where they're trying to, people are trying to sue for groundwater contamination with regard to hydraulic fracturing and none of those have been resolved yet. But in grand, you know, improve, proving groundwater contamination just in general. So there, there, we have, there are a lot of cases involved where um, a factory or a manufacturing plant may be contaminating soil and it's getting into the groundwater. And it turns out that those cases have been extremely hard to prove. Right? So they've been extremely hard to prove um, because of the federal rules of evidence, which also in a lot of state courts, they maintain that these, these same rules. And so my read of that literature is, is that uh, a lot of times when people bring groundwater suits, 
um, they're thrown out, right? Because they can't establish the facts of cause and effect. And this turns out to be a real problem, um, especially for the plaintiffs, but with regard to justice, with regard to justice, um, this is, is gonna be problematic. So, a lot of it is um, an issue of information, right? And so, uh, there are a couple of things I wanna point out. So, in, in a lot of cases, baseline information is lacking, right? And so, if you think about it, one of the problems with your well, you think, you know, you, your well is contaminated, right? Your well is contaminated, but was that a result of natural processes? Because we're sinking wells in areas where there's a lot of methane anyway. And that's like te Texas, they recently investigated a couple of well cases there, and the state came in and they said, well, we can't really tell. Yes, your well is contaminated, but in areas where there's not hydraulic fracturing, wells are also contaminated. So, so proving that, is, it turns out to be a problem. And I see this as an area of a lot of inefficiency. So how can we improve this? All right, so how can we improve this? So one of the things is just to, to try to solve the informational problem. Um, so one of the things we could think about is when people are, when developers are coming into an area, we could look at, say, we'll go in and we'll do scientifically based water quality monitoring in advance of any, any um, development. And then we'll at least have a baseline, right? We'll at least have a baseline. Um, and then that will protect the property rights of the, well, of the well owners that are there, right? And also we'll have some scientific information associated with that. How could we fund this? I mean, one, one obvious thing would be is to, to put, a, put a fee on, on developers and say, if you're gonna come in and develop the area, one, you're, gonna, you're gonna fund, and, we, and it could be cooperative, one of the ways to deal with it, you're gonna fund a water quality monitoring program to ensure that people aren't damaged, and your scientists are gonna be a part of it. So we want this to be, you know, we want it to be legit and we want all parties to accept it. And I see that as one way where the public would be more accepting of, um, of hydraulic fracturing and also it would be to, to solve this information problem. Um, so my takeaway points is from an economic standpoint, right, if we look at hydraulic fracturing, we want to make sure that any environmental costs are externalized into the process itself. Otherwise, it's not, it's not efficient, right? So as economists, um, I think most economists would agree with me, we're not trying to say whether hydraulic fracturing should occur or not, gonna, or, or not occur, because it's gonna happen, and I think there are some large benefits to the United States in general. But at the same time, if we don't incorporate these external costs, then people are going, it's going to appear to be an injustice and a lot of people are going to be against it. And so I think there are ways that industry and the state governments can work together, um, close the information loophole, and people will be better off. Okay? Thanks. Thank you, Nick. And our third and final speaker tonight will be Doug Southgate from The Ohio State University. Uh, Doug specializes in the study of natural resource issues in the U.S. and around the world. He's written numerous books, chapters, and journal articles on public policies contributing to tropical deforestation, hydrocarbon development, the economics of watershed management, and related topics. Doug will speak tonight about fracking and its potential impact on our water supplies. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I've attended these sessions and the economic uh, outreach sessions for a number of years. I've always found them very useful. I'm honored to be invited here as a speaker. Um, I'll tell you, too, uh, in, in large measure, I'm going to amplify uh, what Nick was uh, telling you about with respect to hydraulic fracturing, sort of uh, fill in the picture a little bit in, in some ways. In, in some ways, more about the development itself than uh, than the water issues. Um, actually, as I was listening to the introduction by your president, Andy, I, I thought, well, I'm about a year too late because uh, this my presentation is actually more an energy uh, presentation. And I also regretted. I, I actually do a lot of work on 
water issues in, in, uh, develop, in the developing world, principally Latin America, but also through students in Indone Indonesia and other places. And all I can tell you is that if we think we have water problems in, in this country, uh, the problems are, are much worse. And something that always strikes me, both here and in other countries, is that even though we say that water is valuable, well, it is valuable. As I was observing to a physicist before the session here, bipolarity. Bad thing in people, wonderful thing in water molecules. You know, it makes life possible. But, uh, um, and, and yet, even though it's valuable, we treat it as if it's perfectly uh, useless. Uh, it is priced at zero. Uh, and a, a prime example of this would be India, where nearly 90% of total water use is for agriculture. And I'm, I'm in a department of agricultural, uh, agricultural, environmental, and development and economics. I have a colleague here, so I have to get this right. Um, the, uh, um, so 90% so of water use is for agriculture, all unpriced, and that's not the end of it. Uh, not only is water perfectly free for farmers, including in places that are deserts, about as dry as Arizona, uh, but it's not unheard of in India for state governments, for example, to make the electricity that farmers use to run their pumps to draw water out of the ground in places that have had subsidence or uh, uh, lowering of the water table, worse than anything in Nebraska, I can tell you, uh, the electricity run the pumps is likewise provided uh, nearly for free. And uh, so uh, it's, it's very ironic and talk about dismal, and this is, this, is, this is a dismal situation not created by the application of economic principles, but specifically by the refusal to apply economic principles. Um, I wish I would have chosen to talk about that, Andy. Uh, but I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about shale gas development. Um, oops, I've already messed it up. Uh, I'm going to t uh, begin by telling you, before I turn to the consequences of, of deep shale development, I, I'm going to talk about the drivers of, of this phenomenon that has captured all our attention, certainly in this state and around the country and in other countries. Uh, but begin by telling you about the, uh, the drivers of this. First of all, uh, we do have a, a situation, a somewhat unique situation in the United States that our subsurface mineral resources are actually private property. In theory, if you own, if you own land in the United States and if you or the previous owner haven't, haven't sold off your subsurface resources, you own down to the core, uh, uh, core of the earth. And um, uh, the, this is an unusual situation, even in most Commonwealth countries, that, that doesn't exist. And certainly in Latin America, all subsurface resources are the property of the state. Well, there is one great advantage of subsurface ownership, which is that subsurface resources are influenced by economic incentives, market and otherwise. So uh, with that said, and we, we sort of take that for granted in the United States, and we think about this very fundamental precondition or driver for subsurface uh, resource development. Uh, I'll turn to another driver that's a little more familiar. Um, uh, market forces were strengthened, market forces as an influence on the development of subsurface resources were strengthened um, not during a Republican administration, but actually during a, a Democrat uh, administration, the administration of Jimmy Carter, um, which had some very interesting, very useful deregulatory initiatives in the airlines, for example, but also uh, the Natural Gas Policy Act of 1978 uh, contained a, a, a seemingly innocuous cause, uh, a guarantee that anyone with gas being produced in one state for customers in another state would have uh, guaranteed access to the interstate pipeline system initially at, at prices that were regulated by the feds but but with time more market driven prices but the key thing was access that created what uh, certainly doesn't exist yet in Europe uh, which is a, a genuine continental wide market for natural gas and uh, the creation for a natural gas market uh, uh, had various ramifications or consequences. One was to in increase exploration, uh, including exploration in what were previously thought to be unpromising areas and unpromising geologic formations. But the most important consequence 
uh, and this is always of supreme importance in the energy industry, was to encourage technological improvement. Uh, Daniel Jurgen, who's a great expert of, uh, about this industry, author of uh, uh, widely read books, uh, uh, points out that consistently over time, 75% of the additions in our energy resources are the result not of somebody like Jed Clampett going out and, and poking around in the, in the ground and finding new oil. No, it's technological improvement. And that has certainly happened here. Uh, technology has been developed, and Nick was referring to this, uh, the technologies that, um, uh, that allow us to reach resources that, are, uh, uh, that previously were out of reach, including deep shale formations. I'm, I'm, I'm not a geologist and I don't have the time, but I'll tell you this, the deep shale formations, a mile, mile and a half, two miles, maybe three miles underground, uh, these are the mother load of hydrocarbons. At least, uh, they, they are the remnants of ancient ocean beds. Uh, because of that, they, the, the, the water that's down in, in the deep shales and also uh, formations close to the surface have water, but it's saline water. Uh, but also a lot of hydrocarbons, not, not, de uh, not uh, decomposed dinosaurs so much as decomposed microorganisms that settled in the ooze, the primordi primordial uh, ooze at the bottom of oceans, and that, those are our hydrocarbons. At least 90% of the hydrocarbons originally in these ancient ocean beds are still there. Less than 10% has moved out generally toward the surface, and it used to be that the industry tapped into formations closer to the surface, not the shales. The shales are very deep, they're also very hard. As people in the industry will tell you, the only thing that's harder, H-A-R-D-E-R, -E below the surface is the drill bit itself. So a very dense, hard, hard material and, and very deep, tough to get at. Uh, two innovations, Nick mentioned them, it's really the combination of, of injecting uh, 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 hydraulic or water uh, aqueous fluid containing sand and, uh, and an, a number of chemicals, injecting that at very high pressure in to, to break up the rock as is depicted here. And you combine that with, uh, and, and he, he mentioned that's an old technology, we've been using this in Ohio since the late 1940s. You combine that with what used to be called directional drilling, now called uh, horizontal drilling, and that allows you to drill down and then a, a mile, mile and a half or even more, and then out a mile or more. Uh, it's the combination of the two that has put the shale within reach. Other technological advances as well. My favorite is the microseismic advances that I heard described for the first time a couple of years ago by a PhD geophysicist. And as he put it, you know, this is sort of like a sonar technology. And it's, uh, it's, it's very, very sensitive. As he described it, um, uh, if you, uh, he can pick up with his microseismic technologies, the sensors, uh, uh, the vibrations set off if a full can of Coke, or as some of you might prefer, a full can of beer, uh, dropped on a solid concrete floor 10,000 feet below the surface, you can pick up those vibrations. This is enormously significant because it means that we can now find uh, these hydrocarbon or organic bearing shales more than 98% of the time we drill. Dry holes are a thing, largely a thing of the past thanks to this technology. So a, a number of technological breakthroughs that has, uh, um, have put, in, put within reach um, these deep shale formations. Um, uh, this is only a combination of technology that has been applied commercially for uh, only since the turn of the 21st century. The first application was in uh, northern Texas, the so-called Barnett Play. As recently as 2004, shale or gas from shale formations was not a very important part of the supply picture in this country. In fact, in 2004, so less than 10 years ago, uh, the Federal Reserve Chairman was calling for massive investment in LNG import facilities to compensate for the depletion of not of the shales but conventional uh, shale resources. And then 2008 we had spiking prices. It used to be that prices of gas would go up in uh, very much in line uh, or go down with oil prices. That happened in 2008. Also, they, natural gas prices would, speak, uh, would peak whenever there was a major storm 
uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, where a lot of our conventional gas production is concentrated, and also where we bring in some imports. Uh, but no more. The, the markets have decoupled. Uh, gas has become uh, very cheap, fell as low as uh, $2 in to, uh, 2012. This, among other uh, things, is causing energy companies to seek out shale deposits. Not all shale deposits are the same. They have different hydrocarbons in them. Uh, uh, the, the energy companies are seeking out uh, deposits that are not so much a source of dry gas or methane, what we use to heat our ho homes and increasingly to generate electricity. Rather, they're seeking out sh deep shales that are the source of oil, as in the case of the Bakken in western North Dakota, or uh, oil and natural gas liquids, which is what we have uh, actually in relative abundance in eastern Ohio. I'll show you the map in just a minute. Uh, this is the macro picture. Nick referred to this. Um, uh, you can see that up, well, uh, until past the, past the turn of the 21st century, uh, you can see a little uh, dip there when Alan Greenspan, the former Federal Reserve Chairman, was speaking in 2004, warning about impending sh shortages. You can see that the shale from shale gas, the share of our gas supplies from shale gas had really not broken through very much. Already within a few years, well, by 2010, uh, shale for deep shale formations were the source of 23% of our shale gas, and it's on its way up. You know, by um, before the time many of you are my age, uh, shale formations will be supplying half of our natural gas. Uh, this again, because uh, the prime natural gas producing or the prime shale uh, areas in this state are uh, are rich in natural gas liquids and, and and oil. There's a lot of it, this activity. In fact, this this uh, this state, Ohio, is one of only two. Two states, I think the other one is Colorado, uh, where there are more drilling rigs operating today uh, than there were three months ago. So we're on an upward trend. Uh, you see the numbers here. There, uh, 518 wells have been permitted since, uh, well, in a little more than three years. Uh, that's up from 143 two years ago. Uh, 236 wells have actually been uh, drilled and led uh, so far by uh, um, Chesapeake Energy, which is the second leading producer of gas in the United States. Only Exxon Mobil produces more gas. Here's the map. Uh, I don't know if any of you are from this area, south of I-80, east of 77, and north of 70. This is the sweet spot uh, of the Utica. And this is actually, an, I don't know if it's from the Gund Foundation or an NGO founded by the Gund Foundation. There's a web address, and I'm, I'm leaving this with Andrew. Please get in touch with Andrew for, uh, for a copy of this slide. Or, uh, uh, um, and, and it's updated from time to time. The colors and the letters there indicate the company. So you see all these blue C bills. Each one of those is a well drilled uh, for Chesapeake. Um, natural gas liquids uh, are of tremendous importance for the industry of this state. Uh, it includes, for example, ethane. Ethane is converted into ethylene. Ethylene is in turn in, uh, in uh, uh, becomes polyethylene PVCs and so forth. It's the it, it's the basic building block or pri uh, or uh, prime ingredient of our uh, of our chemical industry and polymer. Uh, sector. The polymer sector in, in Ohio is, is very important. More than nearly 2,500 polymer firms. It's a very, it's a very innovation intensive industry. A lot of small firms, small nimble firms in this industry. It's a little bit like the Mittelstand firms in, uh, in Germany. There you see some uh, information. That all told, these firms employ 130,000 people. Uh, there are indeed, and uh, uh, Nick out, uh, outlined the problems, uh, there are various risks posed by this. No energy source, not even windmills, uh, are, without, uh, are, are without risks. Windmills whack birds, you know, all sorts of golden eagles are dying in Southern California because of uh, windmills. But this industry, like others, has risks. Uh, I would say it was certainly in terms of disturbance of the landscape, keep in mind, well, you've seen the television ads from API and various private companies. It really is true. From one pad, you can exploit resources uh, from, a, uh, from a circular area with a radius of a mile or more. That means much less surface uh, disturbance, and that's a very great advantage. Uh, but probably the most 
most frequent uh, occurrence, adverse occurrence, is some sort of spill on well pads. These tend to be pretty well contained. I would say, by and large, OEPA and the, uh, and the ODNR uh, have, well, they're, they're, they're recognized by other states as having uh, quite sound regulations for this. There are berming requirements and requirements about uh, impermeable um, uh, uh, materials that have to be uh, 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 built in the surfaces of these drilling pads. So if there's a spill on the surface, uh, almost certainly it's going to be contained. Um, another problem, it has to do with a well casing close to the surface. There are five alternating layers, steel, concrete, steel, concrete, steel. Um, and, you know, it shouldn't, there shouldn't be cracks. Uh, but of course, there are, there are accidents. Uh, and within just a few hundred feet of the surface, uh, there are freshwater resources. Uh, so much less probability of an event uh, in this case, uh, but if an event occurs, then we're talking about contamination of, of groundwater. Uh, Nick also talked about the seismic activity in the vicinity of deep wells where produced water. The, I mentioned that there are saline water, uh, well, uh, far below the surface, certainly in the, in the shale, so it, as you extract gas and oil and other hydrocarbons out, out comes uh, uh, um, uh, old ocean water, think of it this way, saline uh, water, along with other trace, uh, trace elements and even radio, radioactive compounds come out of the uh, water. Uh, you can recycle that to an extent, but only to an extent, and then, it, then at some point uh, it has to be disposed of underground. And this is something Gordon and I, and I were talking about this a, a ahead of time. Uh, the, it's safe to say that the geologic mapping for the deep injection wells is, is not what it should be. I'll, I'll, I'll just leave it at that. Um, I do want to say, in just, just by way of closing, uh, Nick said the magic word, which is baseline. Um, uh, through my college, I, my, I'm, I won't re repeat my department's name again because I can't remember, it's too long. My friend Ian came up with that name. Uh, but we're in the College of Agriculture and, uh, and we have an extension or technology transfer service which has been working with farmers, farmers and other rural landowners uh, as they're approached by representatives of, of energy companies to lease their land. Some of them are getting rich from this and so forth. But, but there's a real problem in establishing what, what the environment has been like before the energy companies start working their magic. Uh, and uh, so there's a need, uh, particularly if something goes wrong, there's a need to establish prior conditions or a, or a baseline. It's a tricky problem. A lot of landowners are not keen on this. Uh, uh, for example, they, they might do uh, testing of their water wells and if they find out, I mean, I'm not an expert on this, I have to confess, but as I understand it, if they find out, for example, that, that there's conventional pollution in their water wells, see, fecal coliform, not too unusual, uh, then they have to put, then they have to report that to prospective buyers. And so a lot of landowners who are thinking about selling, quite frankly, would rather not know because then they don't have to report that uh, to the next owner. So uh, this whole baseline issue is a, is a tricky one. Uh, you're quite right, Nick, I, I agree wholeheartedly. What's needed is, is for the companies to be proactive about this. And actually a lot of them, uh, particularly the larger companies are, and they're starting, they, they, some of them have a de facto protocol of testing water quality in wells and other places a mile and a half out from their pads. So I'll mention that. Uh, we have not seen the end of this. Uh, we are in the midst in this country of making a transition from gas, uh, uh, gas-fired generators. The coal is being phased out. The natural gas, uh, natural gas has various advantages, largely because of natural gas development. Our, uh, our uh, carbon emissions are nearly down to the level, uh, they're down to the level that we were uh, 20 years ago or so. Um, that's for the country as a whole. That's a very great benefit. Uh, natural gas is far and away the best fuel in, in, in basic economic terms for generating electricity. Very, very efficient technology. And even if we didn't have environmental, uh, uh, air, if we didn't uh, have air quality regulations, we would still be converting uh, um, uh, generating capacity from coal to gas. And I think we'll see other things. That, uh, it always happens. I study the food economy a lot. 
the main beneficiary of technological improvement of the sort that we've seen here and of the sort that has been experienced in the food economy, the main beneficiary is always the consumer in the form of lower prices. And that has happened here. Not the best of news for the industry. The industry wants to find new uses um, uh, and, and that means they want to compete against coal, they want to export um, and so forth. But uh, uh, probably even if we start exporting, we're still going to have relatively cheap natural gas, which is going to be a tremendous benefit for this country, and including for, say, our chemical and polymer sector and other industries. Well, with that, you know, I'm an economist. I said something's going to be short and clear and lying at least once, so I will sit down at this point. Okay, thank you very much, Doug, and thank you to all of our speakers. Uh, at this point, I want to give a chance to the, uh, the speakers up front here to ask a question of one of the other speakers, if there's anything that came up during the talk and that uh, they found stimulated further conversation. George, if you don't mind, um, I'm not clear uh, about what... Um, well, let's talk about farmers in the watershed of Grand Lake St. Mary. So, as you pointed out uh, very clearly, uh, tremendous water pollution problems, non-point water pollution problems from, from agriculture. What are the obligations, legal and otherwise, for, for farmers to adopt best possible nutrient management uh, uh, um, practices? What are the financial pen penalties, if, if any, of, of not adhering to those practices? Um, the Board of Natural Resources uh, enacted rules just recently, and this rule, like, uh, uh, will call for designation of some watershed as watershed and distress. And once they do this kind of declaration, uh, they will impose requirement on the farmer to prepare nutrient management plan. And this nutrient management plan is supposed to be to show that uh, what the farmer will put in his land will not result in water pollution. We just started in Grand Lake St. Mary watershed and the, the deadline for submission of the nutrient management plan was uh, last, last December. And my understanding, every farmer in Grand Lake St. Mary submitted this plan except for five. And the Department of Natural Resources intend to take legal action against this farmer by issuing them orders and maybe find them uh, uh, in the future. But that's kind of like the approach is taking right now uh, for watershed and distress. We cannot apply this approach across the state. We don't have the resources to do work uh, in every place in the state. Thank you. So I have a, I have a question for George as well. Okay. So uh, of, the, of the things that farmers can do, what are the most effective? It's the most effective thing is to not to over apply uh, fertilizer or manure. Like some farmers, they have excess manure, and the, it is expensive to haul it to another area out of the watershed. So what they do is just apply it uh, on the land as way of disposal, knowing quite well that the, 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 the crop does not need all that much fertilizer. And as a result, you have this excess manure or fertilizer, and it's just... You have rain and runoff, and it goes to streams and lakes. So if, if I could just follow up, so is the problem more from livestock producers then, as opposed to crop farmers who are applying, you know, a, a chemical nitrogen, this sort of thing? Um, my kind of feeling in Grand Lake Cement Mary is the problem is mainly from livestock. Uh, the farm, it is very concentrated area. You have a lot of uh, livestock in very small watershed. And the farmer is over, are over applying the manure to their fields. 
uh, the quantity which is just the land cannot take, cannot really handle. So what it does, it run off and so on. Uh, fertilizer can be a problem in certain area, uh, but like if application of fertilizer, it have kind of little bit self-regulating, like it costs the farmer money to put fertilizer on the land. But like what I hear, like the farmer listen to the uh, broker, the fertilizer broker, the, the guy who sells the fertilizer advise the farmer. So it is kind of incentive for the broker to tell him it is better to put more phosphorus and more nitrogen on land so you can get more of your crop. But like this result in runoff which contaminated with nitrogen and phosphorus which will go to uh, streams and lakes. I have a question for Nick, actually, um, <laughs> related to uh, when when you were talking, you said that, uh, as I understood it, that it's crucial for us to uh, to get people to think about the future consequences of their water that they're drawing today from the groundwater. Um, but given that the private property rights system has been established long ago, do you have any you know potential solutions of what we might do from a public policy perspective to to get people to think more about their, their future action, the future consequences, rather. Well, it, as I mentioned in the talk, it wouldn't be as much of a problem if they didn't interact with one another. So in Colorado, we have multiple people going in and drawing down uh, wells. And so then it makes it a real problem of the commons, kind of like ocean fisheries or anything like that. Um, you know, the only solution would be in, in Colorado, we're not going to implement this, but if you, if you had pump fees, right, where you got charged, basically it would be like a tax, right, a tax on pumping, um, then that would get people to scale back. But absent a pri price mechanism, you have to coordinate everyone in the, in the, that's drawn out of the aquifer. Right? And so it becomes a, a real problem, because even in Colorado, when, um, so the, the only time they have a call, they, actually in Colorado, all water is assumed to be uh, you know, one system with the surface rights system, right? And so they actually will call, they have a call, so senior water rights holders with, with surface rights can get wells shut down, but it still never gets to this problem of kind of this, the, you know, the opportunity cost within the aquifer. But in, in the end, I think that you, you're going you're gonna to see that those resources are going to run out maybe 40 years in big aquifers, maybe 40 years earlier. And so then it, then it really becomes an, an issue of even though people don't like to have their you know, property right infringed upon, it's kind of like how can we save these people from themselves? I have a question for Nick. Uh, uh, in the Great Lake Basin, uh, we have an agreement among the states on the Great Lake Basin is to kind of limits the withdrawal of water or exporting the water from the Great Lake Basin to outside of the basin. Do you see a role for regulations? Like if we know like 10 years from now, Arizona will run out of groundwater. Wouldn't it be a good idea at this point to start to impose requirement saying you cannot withdraw more than this amount of water in order to have sustained source of groundwater for the future. So do you see rule for the regulations? That actually, I think, calls for a change in the property rights system. Yeah. Right. So, you know, in, in the Western states, they have scarcity is built in through the, through the seniority system. But in states where water is plentiful, it's, you know, it's never been perceived as a problem. Some states, Georgia actually is looking at, they have, they're developing water markets in Georgia because they've had a lot of problems lately. So it's, institutions can change and, the, and they'll need to, but maybe not quickly enough. Georgia, Georgia has an unusual circumstance that Atlanta is in exactly the wrong place vis-a-vis -vis watersheds. All the watersheds start in Atlanta and run away. You know, there are no rivers or streams running toward Atlanta. So that's the place to see innovation. Great. So I think at this point I'd like to open it up to questions from the floor. Again, if you have something you'd like to ask, uh, please just raise your hand and, and they'll make their way around to you with the microphone.
Hi, yeah, my, my question is about all those wells, all those blue dots. I'm just wondering, how much water does it take to frack a well, and is that water ever anything we can drink again? And where does it go? Five million. I'll, I'll answer that one. I believe it's five, uh, approximately five million gallons per well. It's a lot. How does, it, how does it compare, say, to a golf course? Uh, I cannot make this kind of comparison. I don't know how much it consumes in a golf course. But we estimated it's 5 million gallons per, uh, per well, and about half of it come back, and you need to dispose of it. Can we drink it? No. No, you cannot drink it. It have, it have like, a very high content of salts. To the point, like, if you discharge to stream, it will kill everything in the stream. Hi there. Um, so we all know that water is going to be a huge problem in the future. Um, we're starting to run out of it in a lot of places. I know many of you talked about that already, including South America, India, China. Um, why would we be using our good water and pumping it into the ground to extract a non-renewable resource that that water cannot be used again when instead we can be investing in solar energy, wind energy, water energy, geothermal energy. Um, do you think that those could be better options or do you think that that's not economically feasible? I think I'll leave that one to Doug. <laughs> Chicken. Okay. Um, the problem with the, 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 think of the problems of the renewable energy resource that you mentioned. Uh, one is a simple matter of cost. There are uh, solar, uh, solar power. I, I always think of um, what they used to say about Brazil, that it was, it was the country of the future and always would be. Uh, uh, solar, uh, solar panels always have been on the brink of becoming, supposedly have been on the brink of becoming economical, but they never uh, quite get there. They're, you know, it's an expensive source of power, certainly much more expensive per kilowatt hour uh, than natural gas. I mentioned natural gas uh, fired generators and um, if, if you have a combined cycle generator, which means that you, you capture and use steam heat, to, uh, the steam, uh, your process steam to uh, generate electricity, it's something like 80% energy efficient, uh, uh, more or less, meaning that 80% of the energy coming into the system is actually converted to electricity, which is uh, which is really something, and it and uh, it you know it, it it makes electricity from natural gas uh, uh, really cheap. The other problem with with solar and wind and so forth, I won't speak to geothermal, uh, is that is that they're highly interruptible. Uh, if, if if you want to have a, a system with a, with a lot of solar power, a lot of wind power, and so forth, you need a backup source, some sort of conventional backup source, which almost inevitably in, inevitably means some fossil fuel, coal fired, gas fired, and so, uh, fired and so forth. So in a sense, you don't really escape it. Uh, here's what I think about this: Daniel Jurgen and others uh, who talk uh, uh, who who speak about this say that. Uh, uh, have, well, they're very upfront about this. They say they no longer talk about peak oil. Obviously, there are still limited hydrocarbons in the ground, and there are limits to how much we want to use in order to avoid carbon emissions, to be sure. Uh, but in, ser in terms of a, a very fundamental sort of resource availability, uh, this, this shale revolution which, which started here because of our tradition of subsurface rights, and we have, a, uh, we have market forces uh, guiding, uh, guiding this industry, which has resulted in technological improvement and so forth. It started here, uh, but really it's a very democratic resource. It's spread all over the place. Mexico has significant deposits, Argentina, Brazil, and so forth. Uh, India, China. China has issues, water issues, uh, really much more acute than what we have, even in a lot of the western states. The deep shales in China are out west where, they're, where water is extraordinarily scarce. And there, it's, the water is a real constraint on the development. However, um, it, so there's a lot of shale around, a lot of hydrocarbons in this deep geologic formation. Uh, it's cheap and it is, you know, it is the dream in a sense. I'm simplifying somewhat, but not too much. It's the dream transition fuel that gives us, so you could, you could see what's happening in natural gas supplies with gas supplies from shale 
uh, increasing and far exceeding what we're losing due to depletion of other sorts of resources, it gives us plenty of time to do the R&D uh, to come up uh, with an alternative that that really can compete in the marketplace in the way that re let's be honest about it, that renewable uh, renewable energy resources cannot compete today or will be able to compete in the foreseeable future. I'll speak to it a little too. <clears throat> Definitely, a lot of people are afraid that, and, and it's true that. Um, you know, inexpensive uh, natural gas is going to drive out innovation in renewable markets. So, you know, a lot of people were thinking, you know, with the peak oil issue, it's, it's interesting. It seems to be a lot of people missed the boat on predicting what was going to happen with shale gas, right? Because we're expanding resources so rapidly. And as uh, Doug was saying, you know, in 2005, you know, informed people weren't very informed on, on what was coming down the, down the road. So I definitely think that it, it's a problem. It's going to make, it, it keeps renewable resource or renewable energy sources out of the money, right? Because, it, you know, when you have cheap natural gas, it's hard to compete with that. Um, I think part of this soft path, if we have the guts to make to, to impose the carbon tax one of the things you could do is is to try to create a soft you know to complement the soft path would be to take a carbon tax and invest that and you know develop renewable technologies um, it, it, you know using using the money from those taxes uh, I agree with uh, uh, Doug and Nick uh, that we will need uh, natural gas a source of energy for the next several decades. Our job at this point is to try to minimize the damage created by fracking and by coal mining. And just to give you an example, like why a gas company would go and use water from a stream or from groundwater to do fracking. While we have like coal mines are full with water, and the coal mine people have to pump this water, treat it, and discharge it. And they all the time arguing with Ohio P about what kind of limits uh, they should discharge. The treatment is kind of expensive. If you can use this water to do fracking, you don't need very clean water to do fracking. You will save money for the coal company. You will save money for the gas company. And you will improve the environment. So we need to be kind of innovative because we are in a situation, yeah, renewable energy is not here yet. We can definitely use it, it have flat its use, but it cannot replace coal and natural gas right now. So we have to minimize the damage created by coal mining and uh, uh, fracking at this point. And if I can add, there, there's a lot of research. This is a major focus of research. and chemical engineering departments, for example, uh, um, green green chemistry solutions to this. I, when I always hear this, it's, it's sort of an infelicitous term. It makes me think of Grand Lake St. Mary's. But green chemistry means coming up with better materials to do the fracturing. Your point is well taken that you don't have to use fresh water. And I think as time goes on, we, the industry will diminish its requirements for that vital resource. Uh, would the... Um Cost uh, so-called cost is two cents uh, two cents on natural gas now. If you were you know, to incorporate the total cost that that has to the society and you know fracking issues, what what do you estimate that cost to be? Would it double or triple or would it be back to ten cents? I you know I could make an argument that the addition to the cost wouldn't be that great because remember that as we use more natural gas to generate electricity we're using less coal um, I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm sort of amused thinking recalling as, as I listen to the discussion here uh, I have a friend in the energy industry this is uh, uh, th th this is not a, a terribly left-wing industry, okay? And I, I know somebody from a manufacturing uh, sector in Ohio that, that sells directly to the natural gas industry, and this, this individual's a knuckle-dragger. And, uh, uh, and he was telling me, boy, I'm really happy with the EPA 
the, the EPA clamp down on coal. What this ind individual is hoping for, that there will be additional, uh, an additional market uh, thanks to expansion of natural gas as coal declines. So uh, when you keep in mind that uh, the, uh, the, the, the electricity that we're producing from natural gas is, is certainly not entirely a, a, a net addition to our electricity supply. Instead, it's substituting for coal-generated uh, electricity. Um, then the increment to take into account the social costs of this might be very small indeed, conceivably even negative. But that doesn't mean that there aren't environmental costs associated yeah. with it. I mean, relatively speaking, you know, the carbon emissions from, uh, f you know, electricity for, for gas plants is about 50% for B per BTU, I think, than for coal. So there's, there's definitely, uh, there are relative advantages. I think that the costs of um, shale gas, you know, exploration and development is to be determined, right? We really, don't have enough experience with it yet. I mean, I think, you know, it could be really expensive if there are a lot of accidents. It's interesting. I think a lot of the problems associated with, um, f f you know, the industry is really are accidents, right? It's more akin to oil spills than, you know, let's say pollution from factories and, you know, in, in constant pollution sources. I think the real, a lot of the dangers are, you know, spills that, yeah, for sp spills that produce water. And also, I mean, at some point, a major water source is going to get screwed up. I mean, it's just going to happen. It's just one of the pieces of it, right? I mean, it, it, and that's, I think when people look at those pictures, you say, well, you know, it doesn't take a brain surgeon to figure out that, you know, there is going to be a problem some point down the road and, and it's going to be major. So we really don't know because it all depends upon the frequency of accidents, right? Certainly in, in, in Colorado, um, the center for, was it Ceres? I don't even know that, that acronym. It's, it's solar it's, energy. It's, no, 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 we have it. It's the Cooperative Institute for Environmental Research and Science, which is a joint, it's joint with the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the University of Colorado. And they did a study of air quality in Erie, Colorado, which is just east of Boulder, about 10 miles, 12 miles. And they put up um, air quality monitoring towers and they used fingerprinting where they could tell where um, emissions were coming from. And they found that along, along there, 55% of emissions in Erie were from oil stuff, you know, from natural gas development. Now they don't know whether it's local or it's blowing down the front range, but now they're comparing the air quality in Erie with Pasadena, which has historically been one of the, you know, a really poor air quality place. So there are definitely environmental problems associated with it and to be determined, but I don't think we know yet for certain. <laughs> Since I can add one more thing here. Yeah, like accident will happen like sooner or later, but if we have the right regulations and the right oversight on the gas uh, industry, I think we able to minimize this kind of, the frequency of this accident and minimize the impact of these accidents. I'd like to ask the panelists. I think one of the problems that um, our consequence of exploitation you haven't addressed, our legacy costs. For example, in Colorado, you have abandoned mines uh, that leak acid water, and uh, it's not the responsibility of the people who did the mining, it's the responsibility of, of the general public. And I think that this is going to happen with the accidents uh, that we're looking for in the future that you talked about. Is there any way to uh, try to make the cost not borne by the public but by the exploiter. Uh, we st don't seem to be able to do that. We have lots of cases, for example, uh, right now in uh, Indonesia there are some problems with uh, legacies that are happening right now but the mines aren't even closed yet and people aren't addressing them. So I don't know whether there's something you can say about that but I appreciate hearing about it. Yeah, um and there, there's one reason to expect these legacy costs to uh, be pretty minimal. 
uh, has to do with, and it's a geologic region, uh, reason. Before I get to that, uh, I can tell you that in, in uh, Pennsylvania, just to our east, where there's been a lot more of this development uh, uh, of the Marcellus uh, deposit, which, which is one of the largest uh, shale sources of gas in the world, um, uh, companies have to put down a guarantee they can either put down a few thousand dollars per well or they can uh, they can post a bond for all their operations in the state and as of a couple of years ago the the cost of that bond was only twenty five thousand dollars which is negligible compared to the potential legacy cost so there's a real public policy problem there however um, I don't think we're going to see where we shouldn't see anything like you know acid mine drainage uh, this sort of thing and it gets to the the nature of this deposit and I, and I want to expand a little bit on this hydraulic fracturing fluid it's it's at least 98 percent water most of the remainder remaining two percent uh, is is sand or something else that that props the cracks open as as I is as, as was depicted in my slide there uh, so you inject uh, so uh, this aqueous solution is injected at a very high pressure to create fissures or cracks uh, in the rock. Uh, if it didn't have sand or something else to prop open the uh, uh, fissures, they would close again right away. Uh, just do you know? It's very deep underground, and 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 so the, the a lot of the problem. They, I, I, um, I'm not I'm not saying the problem won't exist, but a lot of the problem takes care of itself because of the nature of the geology there. Um, and you know, from I I, uh, I frankly worry, and we were discussing this beforehand. There, there, there's a much greater risk uh, associated with a casing failure. Of the pipe going down, particularly sh close to the surface, where it passes through the freshwater aquifers, uh, that's more of a problem. And I, I suppose once you close down a hydraulic fracturing well, um, you know there there could be some migration up through there. I, w I won't say that the chance of that is zero, but uh, I honestly think, certainly compared to old coal mines, for example, um, that that this is not. I know impactful is not a word, but I'll use it anyway. This is not in, as impactful as some of our energy, other conventional energy sources. Call me Pollyanna. <laughs> I think we're running uh, you know, short on time here, but if there is one final question. Uh, my question has to do with the valuation of water. You spoke about the fact that water is often uh, sold well below cost. <clears throat> and I was wondering how, just how, de how undervalued is the price of water and how much of a difference would that make in terms of uh, uh, pollution and exploitation if that wasn't the case? Okay, this is um, it's an excellent question. I I do wish I would have talked about international water uh, water issues. It's it's a severe problem, and uh, the best illustration I can give you is a city where I've done a lot of work, which is Quito, Ecuador, the capital of of uh, the South American country, and um, uh, about 20 years ago, maybe well a little more than that, late 1980s. Uh, the prices that were being charged households for potable water only covered about 40% of building, operating, maintaining the whole system of pipes, pumping stations, and so forth. And um, this had a number of unfortunate consequences, beginning with poor service uh, for the people who, you know, uh, uh, who who were the customers. And I had, I had a personal experience. You know, you, you'd get up in the morning and and turn the uh, now I can't remember the tap. I was about to say, yeah, but, you know, the, uh, you turn the tap and no water would come out. Well, I mean, the, the municipal water company wasn't collecting enough money uh, to, to provide a decent service. Uh, Quito actually, with the advice of economists, sometimes we do good, actually, the, uh, uh, with the advice of, uh, uh, of economists, uh, cost recovery uh, improved more than 90% by cost, uh, the, in other words, prices uh, uh, went up to within 10% of, of the cost of providing this service as opposed to being 60% below that cost. 
Um, the households with connections put up with this. In fact, they were happy with it because the municipal water company used the opportunity to improve service. So past a certain date when I went to Quito, I could take a shower every morning, you know, whether I needed it or not. Uh, and moreover, uh, it was the, the big problem of, uh, of, of water subsidies of the sort that you're referring to is that the municipal uh, company in Quito and other places with this policy didn't have enough money to pay for, to extend service out to the entire metropolitan area. So there were marginal areas where poor people lived and they were paying 10 times the price of, of water. Uh, you know, it had to be tanked in. That's a very inefficient way to move water around. Well, th this is one of these cases where you raise prices to efficient levels for the households that already get the service. Um, by extending service to, out to the marginal areas, you actually brought their prices down. And again, these are poor people. So it was a very attractive policy instrument. And moreover, Quito, which formerly, where the water company couldn't uh, you know, they didn't have full cost recovery. There was nothing left over for sewage treatment or for watershed protection. Well, since they made that reform, they've they've made some pretty impressive strides uh, in those areas. So, uh, the hopeful part of this story is that potable water subsidies are easy to, relatively easy to deal with. The problem, as I as I mentioned before getting into my presentation proper, is agriculture and agricultural uh, subsidies, first of all, are much greater. You, you're, you're lucky if to, to get 5% cost recovery in a lot of these countries. In other words, 95% of the costs are subsidized. And reform is very difficult because any subsidy, including an irrigation subsidy, gets built into land prices. In other words, people will offer to buy, offer more for land that's irrigated or going to be irrigated. Um, so in that sense, you know, your, your land prices reflect the subsidy. Well, if you start reforming things and raise cost recovery, say, from 5% to 20%, you're still well short of 100%, you're, you're putting farmers who bought land at those inflated prices, the subsidy inflated prices, you're putting them in a difficult position. Some of them even will go bankrupt. Uh, at the very least, they're really going to dig in their heels and resist this. So uh, long and the short of it is, potable water subsidies have been relatively easy to deal with. And the World Bank, Inter-American Development Bank, and so forth, have made some pretty impressive strides. And, and China, actually, has better water pricing policies. Chile, Israel has excellent water, pr uh, water pricing policies. But, but especially on the, uh, uh, on the agricultural side, it's, it's a very difficult problem. You put your finger on something important. In the U.S., most cities are have big capital backlogs, right? So you, when you go to like New York, has a tremendous capital backlog backlog because they haven't replaced pipes and stuff under their streets, and this is kind of played out in all over the United States because people don't want to invest in this. Um, I don't have the, the statistics at my fingertips, but I have actually I'm in another um, a talk I gave in, in San Diego. But so the, the efficient pricing for delivered water, for treated water, um, it kind of is pricing along the long run marginal cost curve. So that's a very technical term. But basically, what that says is, you know, you want to think about the marginal, short term marginal cost, what it costs to treat water pump it, get it to deliver it. So that's one aspect of it. And then you want to think about, you have to have um, enough cost recovery to, re to maintain the capital you have and grow the system as you, as you need to. And in the United States, we're really falling short on that these days. And um, cities are really facing this. New York is in really, really bad shape. And so what do you get? You get water mains break and things like that. And so you get interruptions in service. So that's you know, if you think about it, most places where water is abundant, it's free. The water itself doesn't cost anything in Ohio, right? You just, you, you know, you draw the, you, yeah, you draw the water out. It's all about treatment and delivery. Um, if you have scarcity where you're running short on water, so Phoenix often, or, or Texas has, they definitely run into water shortages where there's excess demand for the amount of water they have. Well, then you, you know, the efficient way to deal with it is price it. But in order to clear the market in a lot of those, you probably need to have water increase fivefold, right? And so, which is not inconsistent in a lot of countries um, in Northern Europe, water is about three times as much delivered water as what we pay in the United States on average. So. Yeah. We are lucky in the United States and especially in Ohio, 
but I consider I live in the city of Columbus. Uh, the amount I pay for water and sewage is less than what I pay for cable, and less than the amount I pay for my phone service. But when you go to city and ask them to do improvement in their water and the wastewater system, usually they are reluctant to do it. And the, that result in shortage in the infrastructure to treat water and the wastewater. Like, it's just when you compare the service offered by water and sewage, the importance of water and sewage compared to cable, and the price we pay for cable versus the price we pay for water and sewage, it's just mind-boggling. Like, we need to invest in water and wastewater. So we should watch cable TV and drink beer. And drink beer rather than... <laughs> <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> <laughs> All right, with that, uh, I'd like to uh, bring the uh, evening to a close. Uh, I know that a lot of people still have to travel yet tonight. Uh, I would like to just thank our panelists one more time for sharing their insights with us. Nice to meet you, Jim. Thank you, George. Uh, Thank you also to the Department of Economics and to the Volta Mata Center for sponsoring tonight's event. And thank you all for being here. Have a good night. <laughs>